All right, Waitley Elementary School Committee meeting. Calling the meeting to order at 404. Um, do I have a motion to approve the very long minutes? So moved. Second. Okay, all in favor, Bob? Yes. Beth? Yes. Maureen, yes. Okay, financial statements. I'll turn it over to you, shall we? Okay. Um, I emailed out a report to you all, and I sent the general fund and school choice expense reports, which were through October 31st. Uh, there were 14 warrants reviewed and signed electronically, totaling $55,422.65. Um, I don't have any concerns to report about the general fund at this time. We continue to monitor accounts, um, looking for anywhere that we can capture savings or any overages, but there's really no concern right now. There is some savings um, in the Waitley general fund budget due to some staffing changes, um, whether people's steps came in um, higher or lower. Um, so we have a little bit of savings to hold on to there, uh, but I'm happy to take questions about specific line items if you have them. I I looked through it today. I had Donna print me one, and it's always nicer versus looking on a computer. Yeah. And I only saw a couple little tiny little things. So I think it, we're in great shape. I mean, you know, good job with the money, I guess, right? Yeah. I mean, I think we were, we have been really conservative, um, and we've certainly been using any COVID relief funding that we can before we hit general fund lines, such as supplies and materials. Um, technology has been a huge expense. So that's one of the lines that you would see right now is, you know, negative about $500. Um, but we may be getting some reimbursement that we can throw back in there or maybe able to reclassify some things. But overall, I think we're in good shape. Um, and so the next piece that I want to talk about is school lunch. So this has been a point of concern month to month that we continue to talk about. Um, our government reimbursements are covering our food and supply costs. Uh, the cafeteria staff have served about 900 breakfasts, just over 1,000 lunches, and then there's been about 400 breakfasts and 400 lunches picked up by community members. And that's not just necessarily Waitley residents. Um, Waitley is a pickup spot for anyone from our five communities. So if someone's in the neighborhood and they want to stop and grab um, food when it's available, they're getting lunches and breakfast available at the same time for pickup. So um, Waitley has been in decent shape as far as that goes. The benefit in Waitley though, unlike some of the other schools, is that our wages are budgeted into the general fund. They have been for several years. And if you remember last year, we switched that to the um, school lunch account because there was such a surplus in that account. Um, and we wanted to try to use down some of that money. Well, going into this year, we were not sure what the school lunch account would look like, so we kept it on the general fund. Um, so our expenditures are not as high. Even though our revenue is high, the expenses are low. We're paying for food costs and we're paying for supplies. So right now we have a net income year to date of around $3,500, which is a positive compared to some of our other schools right now. Um, and the account is still in good shape. We're looking at having over $50,000 in that revolving fund. Um, it would be my recommendation to keep things the way that they are, keep staff being paid out of the general fund and leave those revolving funds there. We're likely gonna need them next year when we have to try to bring down our general fund budget somehow. So we may be able to supplement in some ways. You'll also see on the capital report that we're gonna talk about a little bit later that there are some kitchen expenditures on that list. So um, if we do have some extra money that we don't need for wages in the school lunch account, it might be a good time to use some of those funds for equipment and things like that. I know Mary has tables on the list that she's been talking to Bill about. So I'd really like us to move forward with the existing plan and not move those funds unless you're opposed to that. Any questions about any of that before I keep going? So you were no. saying about, oh, I'm sorry. The 400 breakfasts and the 400 lunches, that could be from any kids that are home from all five schools? Correct. Okay. Waitley, Frontier, and Conway are pickup locations. So Sunderland and Deerfield Elementary do not have pickup at the school. 
because they so were someone, yeah, so someone could come over to Waitley and and grab food from pickup there. Okay. Seems like a lot, but that's good. I guess we're not somebody's not going hungry. <laughs> and it's just students. It is children, any children under the age of 18. It does not have to be a student at the school. It could be a sibling that goes to another school or doesn't go to school at all. Okay. And so um, we're good for the wages for the rest of the school year out of the general fund. It's next year that's going to be um, tricky. Yeah, I mean, I think we're going to be realistically looking at some general fund cuts next year. So if we have revolving funds available to help supplement that, then that will be helpful. Um, you know, there's a lot of unknowns at this point still about the uh, FY22 budget. We still have unknowns about FY21 at this point because the state has not passed. Um, so I mentioned here in the last piece of my report that the town of Waitley has not requested any information from us yet on budget planning. They haven't sent their timeline. Um, typically, this would be the time of year that we are starting conversations. And, you know, Darius and I are certainly thinking about it, but it's not something that's fully on the radar at the present um, to start building because there's just so many unknowns. Um, and I think the town understands that and they're realistic about the expectations of the timeline. So we're kind of in a holding pattern right now. Okay. Chrissy, did you have something about school lunch? Uh, well, it was more about um, what you mentioned about the capital planning list. So we can talk about that when we get to new business. Okay, great. Um, so there's a couple of other things here on my report. One of them, I think we probably, I know we'll circle back to. So the phase three planning, it was confusing at the Deerfield meeting when I started talking about the finances for phase three planning before we got to the phase three plan. So I think we'll wait on that conversation because it'll make more sense. But if you did read the report, there is a request for an additional IA that goes along with the phase three planning of getting students back in the building more frequently. Um, so we'll talk about that again a little bit later. Um, and then the only other thing to comment on, oh, two things, I'm sorry. One is COVID. Um, so the town of Waitley has fully supported our request for Municipal CARES Act funding. Um, so that's a total of about $58,000 for Waitley. Uh, some of that is reimbursement because we've already paid for some items, but mostly the a good chunk of it, about 20,000 of it, is going to be for new items that are primarily technology that Scott Paul is going to go ahead and order for us. So we're grateful for the town's support in that. Um, they were really clear. I had a nice conversation with Brian about it that the select board wanted to make sure that if they could support the school, they would. So that's great. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. Absolutely. And then Waitley had another 37,000 or so in DESE related grants on their own that they received, which we've pretty much spent down at this point. There's some money um, remaining that Chrissy and I are in conversation about how to spend um, because some of that does have a timeline. One is um, the December 30th and then the other one I think goes through the rest of the school year, but we're, we'll definitely use up the rest of those funds. Um, the only other comment is that chapter 70 numbers, the house is currently in session. They're working on budgets. Um, the updated cherry sheets did come out and the state is supporting a level fund of chapter 70. Um, so what that means for Waitley is a loss of about $2,000 in revenue and that goes directly to the town. So we haven't heard any word yet on whether or not they want us to make a reduction of $2,000 in the budget. Um, it's a minimal amount of money, so hopefully they won't. Uh, what it really is, is the $30 per pupil extra that we get awarded on the foundation budget. Um, they're not granting that to any school across the state. So, um, you know, again, still not approved. So hopefully it, that, that's the worst of the damage, but we'll let you know as we get more info, obviously. Okay, thank that's you. You're welcome. Thank Thank you uh, to the town of Waitley also for that. Yes, thank you, Shelley. Okay, so no public comment. Um, I see there's a couple extra people on here. I didn't know if anyone was gonna be speaking at public comment. I know Bob said that Donna said there was no written comment. Okay. Hi, Lisa. And um, 
uh, Jameson's not on yet, so as far as I can see. So we can go on to snow days, Darius. Yeah, that's just me closing the loop on that. Uh, we kind of talked about it last, if someone was watching this like a TV series, they would have saw that last time we talked about it, what was going to happen. I did send out a letter to family saying that, you know, we will have remote days for snow days um, unless we get a lot of snow or something that causes a large amount of power and internet outage. So um, that was just kind of the follow up on that. I kind of left it on the agenda there. So. Okay. We're on to the uh, the two policies to vote to approve them first. Yep. So the only difference in the change of the two policies is that we did have a comment from school committee, uh, some one of the committees regarding removing the names from the anti-discrimination and anti-harassment policy so that the names of the staff members in charge of each section put there by title. So that way we didn't have to update them all the time if there was any staff changes. Um, and so you can vote them together or vote them separately. It's up to you. So moved. Okay. Second. Beth. <laughs> Aye. Was that a second? I, I didn't see. It. Oh, okay. Um, Bob. Yes. Beth. You you already said yes. Maureen, yes. That was for both um, policy ACAB and policy BEDH. And we're now into new business, the community health indicators. Yep, and as I said, so just for, you know, I didn't say it right in the beginning, I'm in the middle of dealing with an issue for the school, so I may have to step away if my phone rings, but, um, and I'll ask either Karen, uh, Kim or Shelly to jump in. Shelly would have to go off memory, and Kim's been um, somewhat a part of the different things presenting tonight, so, um, but I'll go as far as I can. So let me go through the, the metrics that we discussed the other night. I mean, we discussed the other night as well, but um, I have a little, uh, let me present my screen here. Darius, do you want me to present the PowerPoint for the just in case? Yeah, here's an idea. Excellent. So tonight we are also Whitley School Committee members and for the first time broadcasting our Google Meet onto YouTube as the live stream because we had problems in the past. So, and there's actually a delay, there's a 10 second delay between our presentation and what happens on, um, <clears throat> on the screen. So I just wanna make sure it was coming up and everything was going fine with Kim presenting it and it is. So let me kind of go through it. <clears throat> um, so the, the, the key, the key, um, so this is the kind of our key mitigation strategies. We kind of make sure we remind everybody, you know, uh, masks, social distancing, hygiene, and um, uh, meaning chillness. I was supposed to fix that, and I didn't. Um, <laughs> if you're unwell, stay home um, and get tested if you're showing symptoms. So but next slide. These are our key, the, the data sources that we're using. It's the same as the last report. I highlighted anything in yellow that's been changed. So these are the, the, the information from the last report. Go ahead, Kim. Oh, school committee members, if you haven't checked your email, I did send this, every slideshow that's being done tonight, I did send to your email, um, as well as the um, Excel spreadsheet for the uh, capital stuff that we're talking about later on. So if I move too quickly or something, or you wanna go back and look at things. So, um, Basically, this uh, these metrics I sent to the boards of health last Tuesday, Monday or Tuesday, um, and then on Friday the governor came out with this page and changed kind of everything. So, um, so I inserted this. This is the one page that is different than what was sent to the board of health. Um, the governor basically came out with a um, new calculation for um, communities under ten thousand um, last, in basically saying. If you're a red community, you have to be red for a number of weeks before you should be closing due to your red status and not having cases in the school. And I just wanna be very clear from the beginning, we work closely with the, our boards of health. The one thing about being a small community and having a close knit relationship with our boards of health, um, the boards of health are, are looking at the, the information kind of live as it's being reported to determine whether or not it's affecting schools um, and that sort of thing. Uh, there was a presentation um, by, a, Jessica, who's a um, Corwin, who's a school committee member of 
Sunderland, who spoke at, at Frontier the other night, concerns that the actual percentages when you get to 5,000 and you have 15 cases, the percentage versus 10,000 really is potentially larger. Um, however, we're not going to be using I, we're not going to be using the, the color codes here to be shutting down school. I think we'll be shutting down well before we have those type of numbers or any of those kind of numbers would be um, you know affecting our schools um, for closure. So, but these are with the, what the state's coming up with. Um, next slide, Kim. We lost Maureen there, but I'm going to keep moving. Um, again, as I talked about, the, they rec this, the state recommends that school districts be changing, on, changing instructional modes from remote to hybrid based on three weeks of consecutive reporting. So um, they want to see three weeks of data in order for you to be doing that. Again, I think our metrics are a little bit stronger um, and having the oversight from the Board of Health um, on those. So next slide. Oops, sorry. You know what, I'll get through this and then call him right back. Um, their data indicators, the, the biggest change here is that if we have any of these data indicators, it will do, it will, um, any of these data thresholds are met, the district will consult with the local Board of Health, either by individually or by um, all four towns, depending on uh, what indicators are hit. Next page. Um, the, the, I think it was, uh, I think it was daily rate before that. It's a daily incident rate. We modified that to match with the, um, which has come out of DESE um, in the state, in the Mass Department of Public Health. So that was just a, uh, one word makes a big difference, but it, it was a changing of that word. Um, the, the, this is right here is the biggest change that you're talking about the secondary indicators. And if, if we have 50 or more cases in Franklin County, which is the new, um, is the new number is that we have a consult with the local board of health to look at those cases to see if those cases are clusters in a you know a conjugate setting much like we had with umass and sunderland a few weeks ago you know a correctional facility that could be that we also have in franklin county or or something like that looking at what where those cases are um you know when those indicators get hit you know we have that um, meeting with the local boards of health and so that's that's the big change the biggest change i would think operationally within these metrics next Slide. Um, there's no change in our judiciary, judiciary, I have trouble with that word, um, indicators, there's been no change there. Um, <clears throat> and then the last few slides are talking about that there's a mobile testing unit and we wanted to add that to our metrics, but basically causing that if you have closure related to two or more cases in a district, you can request the um, the mobile testing unit from the state that comes out free of cost and tests your school community. And then the next two pages there um, kind of goes through, um, you know, what the mobile testing unit is um, and, you know, basically lets you to get a snapshot of your community should you have an outbreak. And this is one of the things that the state put forward. Um, and then one more page kind of going through and he talks about what the indicators are in order to have the mobile testing unit come out to a school. Um, um, you know, so it, yeah, it's within a 14 day, having two more individuals within a single classroom test positive for COVID-19 um, and then have transmission exposure likely due, um, you know, to that exposure is, the, is one of the main indicators there. And then it kind of grows from there, but you can kind of read through those. I won't read those all out loud to you, but you know, and also this is right now with the, the boards of health um, and you know, with the update put in, I have a meeting tomorrow morning with the boards of health at 8.30 to kind of go through um, their thoughts on this. Some of them have voted it prior to the change of adding the state's information in. So they may have to revote that, but it's keeping you all up to speed where we are um, with those metrics. That's it. Any questions on it? Nope. Thank you. Okay, so we're on to the phase three hybrid planning. Yes, that would be me. Sorry, Christy, that's you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 
Okay, can you guys see that? When it comes on. Um, so, obviously I'd like to have all the kids back tomorrow full time. Um, but there are quite a few hurdles in the way. Uh, so we're trying to get, obviously, the kindergarten and first grade to come back um, as of December 7th. Originally, I had been thinking um, November 30th, but it seems like given we're just coming off of Thanksgiving at that point, that it made sense to wait an additional week. Um, in thinking about the challenges to making sure that we can put this together safely um, and effectively, we have to consider the students who are full remote in kindergarten because the kindergarten class is 90% of the time outside, regardless of the weather. Um, it's good I, I hired someone young and hardy to, to teach kindergarten for the year. Um, and the, the kids are really loving it. They come all bundled up and, and they're having a great time, but it does leave those full remote kids um, not getting as much attention as we would like them to. So that's one of the things that we're working on um, also, I have a first grade teacher who's working from home. The IA from that classroom, who's also a certified teacher, has stepped into the in-person role, leaving that room without an instructional assistant. Um, the next phase would be to bring grades two through six back as of January 11th. Um, and in that group, I've got grade three is down in IA because she's working from home and grade five is also down in IA because she's working from home. Um, and those are really our, our, our biggest hurdles. Um, and I, I made some notes there. We've always loved having two adults in the classroom and it's really always been up to now a luxury and now it is a necessity. Um, the music and art classes are being taught remotely. And so the instructional assistant has to be in the classroom to facilitate those. Um, they're also a, a key part of connecting those full remote kids into what's happening in the classroom. So it's really, um, it's, it's not optional to have two adults in those classrooms. Um, and at this time, we haven't, we don't have any substitute teachers. I've been doing all the substitute teaching, which, by the way, I kind of love um, thinking about trading in my, <laughs> trading in one job and, and okay. subbing. It's been really great to be with the kids, but also it's been really great to see, um, what the true challenges are with, with what's going on in the classroom. This is a, just a completely different animal. You know, I, I thought I had seen everything in education and this is just entirely different. And it's, it's a huge lift for our staff members. It's, it's really a lot of work. Um, and I was even saying to Darius last week, I, I can't even really put into words the things that make it so difficult because it seems on paper, like it should be so easy. You got kids at home, you got kids in front of you, you you bring them in on the screen and voila, you're all set. But it's not as easy as that in elementary school. Um, it really has to be two sort of distinctly different paths that are connected in content. Um, so staffing is our biggest issue. I was concerned about transportation, but I called the bus company today to confirm they can fit um, 22 kids on the bus. There are essentially 22 spaces that allow um, distancing. And once we have everyone back, um, bus W1 would have 10 students and W2 would have 18. So we're getting up toward the, the upper end of that range, but it's still, um, it's still doable. We'd have to change some drop off and pick up procedures. Um, I was also concerned about rec breakfast and lunch because I'm not sure if any of you have seen the breakfast or lunch, but they are fabulous. It looks like, you know, a gourmet to go bag, um, but they're very time consuming because everything has to be individually wrapped and that put in these fancy containers. And um, I was concerned about whether or not we'd, we'd have a, a little crunch on our hands in terms of being able to get all the lunches out on time. But I spoke to Kathy and she said that we will make it work. So um, a lot of the things that I had imagined were gonna be tricky are, are gonna be a little easier than I thought, but that the piece about um, having staff in the classroom is gonna be our, our biggest hurdle. Any questions?
So with the staffing being a primary issue, we do need to hire another IA to support Chrissy's plan. Um, so we estimate that that cost will be under $15,000 for the rest of this year. And it will be a temporary one year position, a, basically a long term sub assignment, not on contract. Um, and it will be only a one year appointment. And I do believe that we have savings in the general fund to pay for that position and that we don't have to pull funds from any other funding source. Would it be a one year or just till June? Well, just till June, yeah, for this school year. Yeah, and um, is that gonna be a floater or somebody for a specific grade? So once, once I have everyone back, I will no longer need the, um, the internet cafe room or what we've called the remote learning room or Camp Lola. It's been called a thousand different things. When I don't need that anymore, um, I've got two classrooms without an IA. Lola, who's been doing the, um, the remote learning room, can go into one of those grades and that will leave me needing one other instructional assistant. So that person will be put um, in the, the remaining classroom that doesn't have an IA. Um, it also will hopefully, give, you know, a, a little bit of a cushion if I am at some point not enough people to cover for everyone who is out. Um, it, it's it's tight. It's a little bit of a house of cards. I, I, Kim has come to my rescue on many occasions at this point. Um, you know, it, there's a, a group of kids who's, who have had um, days of school where they were uh, co-taught by me and the curriculum director, which is pretty good setup. Um, we had a lot of fun doing it, uh, but it's, it's, it's tricky. I get very nervous when the, you know, phone rings in the morning or I get a text in the morning, I'm always thinking like, is this the day that I'm not going to have enough people to cover everything? So having a, one additional person will really alleviate some of that. Uh, Chrissy, one question about uh, the young Kids you mentioned um, the kindergartners being outside most of the day and the first grade uh, for teaching from home. How um, plan to support those remote learners in that situation when all the kids and you know those teachers are focused on those kids in school? Well, so in first grade, it actually works out pretty well because the first grade teacher is remote herself. Um, and first grade is the grade with the most students who are who are on a full remote program. There are six first graders. So she will um, she will obviously work with those six graders, those six first graders. Um, there will be times in the day when they all come together in the classroom through technology. Um, but you know, we don't want we don't want to bring our kids to school for first grade and then put them on a screen all day because we might as well just leave them at home at that point. Um, so it's about finding that balance and um, also looking for a similar kind of solution for kindergarten so that the, the kiddos who are at home are getting the attention that they need and deserve, um, but not interfering what, with what needs to happen for kindergarten in person. You know, I, I don't think I have to tell anyone that remote learning is not really meant for elementary school and certainly not meant for early childhood. So it's been a it's been a huge challenge. But um, all the the K one staff they've they've worked together so well to try and pull things off. It, it, you know, it's tricky when you've got kids at home and teachers at home and kids in person and teachers in person. It takes a lot of teamwork. So you know, one of the silver linings is is that we've gotten really good at communicating and working together. So that's a that's our plus. So Chrissy, how does that work with the first grade teacher being fully remote when the kids are in school? Is the um, substitute teaching or is the teacher on her computer teaching? So what the, does that look like? Fortunately, the IA that's been in that classroom for the, this will be her third year, um, she's she's a certified teacher. She's, she hasn't taken on her own position yet because she's getting her master's degree right now. Um, and so it worked out better because if you remember in the beginning of the year, we really wanted the kids, all the kids outside as much as possible, which made it really difficult to connect with the kids at home 
due to technology. We don't have Wi-Fi outside the building. Um, so it's been pretty separate. And then on, um, on their full remote days, everyone's together. So their in-person teacher is Ms. Chapdelaine on Mondays and Thursdays. And then the whole crew is together Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday. Um, so we, we want to make sure that we are still planning things that allow the kids to feel like one unit. Um, but they, they really are sort of taught separately. But the team comes together and they do all the planning together. So what's happening for one may, may look a little different in, in both settings, but it's the same content. So they're sharing the same read alouds and they're doing, you know, covering the same math content. So they're staying on the same page. It's really, it, they, it's been a remarkable team in, in first grade. But when the kids are, like when the first graders are in school, Miss Chapdelaine is teaching, yep. but when they're remote, the, the first grade teacher is teaching. And Miss so, Chapdelaine goes, goes with them so that she's, you know, she's together with them and seeing everything that's going on so, so we can keep everyone together. So when they're in person, what is the first grade teacher doing? Is she teaching the remote kids? And it just, I mean, it was sort of coincidental that the the grade that had the most remote kids was also the grade that had the teacher who was working with them. So it was a little bit of symmetry there. Okay. Anyone have any questions? Any other questions? Um. I don't know. <laughs> Can we take? I, I think that's up to you, Maureen, because it's you're running the meeting. Um, I get. I guess we can. We can take a question. I'm not sure if we can give an answer because if it's not something that we, we had planned for. But go ahead, Lisa. I was just wondering how many kindergartners were remote. Because you talked about how most of the time the kindergartners were outside, but that there were some that were remote. So I was just wondering how many were. Um, right now we have three kindergartners who are remote. Okay, the next thing on the agenda is capital planning, which I don't know if... Shelly or Kim can give an update? Okay, Shelly. Yeah, I, I can definitely do that. I can share my screen. Um, Chrissy, I think you talked to Bill, so I would ask you to jump in also because I may not know specifics about the project, but I can certainly share the working document with you. Um, let me see how I do this. Chrissy, do you have to stop presenting so I can present or can I just override you? It should override me. We, we okay. learned the hard way this summer. Um, where is it? Let's see. Present now. Can you guys see that? Can you see the my screen? Yep, it's working. Yes. Oh, yep. Okay. Great. Do you have the? Spreadsheet, I can't see it on the video also. Yep. Okay. Um, so we're, we're, we revamped the spreadsheet this year. Just if you're wondering, wow, this looks a little bit different. If you've seen it in years past, we're trying to get all of the data more cleanly in one place. Um, so there's a couple of projects here at the top in gray, lines rows three and four, um, that you can see are completed projects and then the year that they were completed. Um, we requested funding for the skylights to be replaced as a live document, so I'm going to update that right now. Um, the quote was 7,900. The town approved 8,000, and that I believe Chrissy can confirm is in progress. I'm not sure if it's finished at this point, um, but I know Bill was working on it. Um, so then we go from there into priorities. So ones, twos, and threes, and then sort of farther out from that is things we're just thinking about for the future. And this list can get reprioritized every year. Um, so what we're looking at right now for um, 
asking the towns for FY22 capital funding are rows seven and eight here, um, where there is a new kitchen steamer and then replacement of three classrooms in fourth, fifth, and sixth grade um, and on the floor there. The other thing in uh, row six I just learned about today is that there was a project that was done a few years back that came in under budget and the town has carried $8,700 forward to the new year. So we're able to use those funds now. We just got approval from the town administrator and we're gonna start working on and planning to replace the office in, or the floor in the nurse's office. Um, so that's the short list, you know, the twos and the threes, you know, are really things we're thinking in the future. Obviously a driveway upgrade is a big one. Um, and then you'll see on here, there, there are kitchen things like I referenced before, the steamer, the cafeteria tables, um, there's some additional hood upgrades that are needed and then the dishwasher, the walk-in cooler. So it seems like some of those um, cafeteria things we could potentially use revolving funds for if we have a good surplus left at the end of this fiscal year. Um, Chrissy, I don't know if you have anything to add from your conversations with Bill about any of those projects, but I don't even think we have a deadline yet from the town when they want the capital information, um, but we're starting to think about it because it's typically due sometime in December or January. Yeah, I got so a question. Go ahead, Rebecca. Those, those, the, the tables in the cafeteria, were those the ones you were describing for the little kids originally? Yeah. We had talked about that last year. At this point, no one's eating in the cafeteria, so we're not thinking too much about our our tables. But um, you know, it's it's amazing how our sort of priorities shifted a little bit since last time we spoke about capital improvements. Right. Um, and certainly, right right now, they're functional. They're you know aesthetically, they're looking a little old. So it's certainly not a crisis at this point. Um, we had the replacing three classrooms, fourth, fifth, and sixth, was in last year's capital request. And obviously then things happened. So we're putting those back on, but the original plan had been to do the fourth, fifth, and sixth grade floors over this past summer, and then finish out the classrooms. The next year. I don't know if we need to put it on the list somewhere now that we, once those, fourth, fifth, and sixth are done that we're also going to want to do. Um, there's two other classrooms that we'll need. Flooring. So if you look on row 22, he does have flooring upgrades, carpet removal, which rooms are left. So, you know, we'll cycle those up as we need to, and you guys figure out what classrooms remain. Okay. That should, that should probably come up towards the top of the list here once we get those other floors done, correct? I would say. Yeah. 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 I mean, then there's a couple of things on here that really aren't capital, you know, here where he's got repair toilet floor drains, 3,500. Um, this, you know, yearly roof inspection, that's really a deferred maintenance item. So some of these aren't capital, but it's also these bigger things that sort of keep falling to the wayside. So putting them on this list, it gets it on our radar for things that we need to do in the future that might be more costly than a typical um, general building repair, repair line in the general fund. Chrissy, I see there's playground upgrades on the bottom. Um, I was part of the group that put that original playground or upgrade playground that was out there. What are we missing? Are we miss? What are we missing for all kids to enjoy the playground if they can even use the playground right now? Anyway, right? Well, right now they can't. Um, okay. But I spoke to someone last year, probably last fall, prior to the world being turned upside down, about um, getting a, a price for um, like a pre-K kindergarten playground. And, you know, someone came and we looked at the space and um, she gave me a catalog. The numbers are huge. I know if you've worked on playground things before, but that was, you know, our goal is to have a an early childhood playground um, okay. that's also obviously um, fully accessible. I think I think we were talking about that even before you were hired as principal. We were talking about having something for the little kids as a playground. So it's been on the list for a while. I see there's CPA possibilities, and I 
totally agree that might be a good spot for some CPA money is for that little playground for the little kids. So. And there was a summer camp, um, I think, to help fund put funds towards that a couple summers ago, but I'm not sure. Probably didn't raise, you know, enough. We raised, thank you for remembering that. That was such a fun camp. That's when I was the early childhood coordinator and there w was money raised and put aside for that, but it was really just under $2,000. It was not a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah, but 2000 is 2000 so that's good okay hey so, kim do you have do you have the gentleman's name that's going to do the anti racium racium you have um, james i only have his email address but i can email him now i can also show you we could jump ahead if you want and i could show you what the district admin is doing at this time I, because i'm such a newbie and mm -hmm. I, I, you know i know uh chrissy's requesting that um ia an additional ia i didn't know if further discussion needed to happen with that and a vote i'm not really sure how it works so i didn't want to get that lost in the sauce before i start presenting so I think because we're using available general funds, I'm not, I don't believe we have to vote on that. I think if we were looking to use a funding source that was going to increase a different fund, we would have to. Um, I might be, Darius is saying yes, we're okay. So. Yeah, we don't need an official vote, but you know, the way we run things, we want to make sure you guys are apprised of what's going on. And if you want to just, you know, I think obviously you're not objecting, we're not hearing you're objecting to it. So, um, I think that's that what we're trying to, you're okay with us moving forward. Absolutely. <clears throat> Thank you. Again, my apologies for having to step away. I know it's rude, but sorry. We were talking about you while you were gone. Why wait? <laughs> so do you want to move to admin anti-racism? I'll present and Darius is here and he can narrate unless you need to move away. Yeah, let me narrate as far as I can go. So, you know what, Kim, if, if Jameson doesn't jump on, um, maybe something caught him up at work. You, you've been such an equal, integral part of with the, what we did for the professional development uh, on November uh, 3rd there. I think we could talk about what happened there, and I think that'd be a, a super update. So getting your mind thinking about that as I go over this. So um, as part of, um, I mean, I, I forget what I say at what school community meeting, but, you know, the, the administrative team is also... Um, doing some professional development around anti-racism. Um, and we did, we're doing some of the work with the teachers, but the way the start of the school year started, it, it was very clear from the very beginning that um, we, the way it works is during the professional development time, many times people are getting pulled away. And there was also this, um, I felt a need for what can we do for professional development around how do we educate leaders to lead anti-racism and support teachers and other staff members in a community. So I thought it should look a little bit different. Um, and um, so I'm gonna go through this and I'll explain where, what we're doing. Um, and also there's still a couple um, couple holes we're trying to fill. So I was hoping to get a little further along at this point, but we're done. So um, this is our, I'm not gonna read word for word. Again, I sent this out to school committee, um, but this is our um, anti-racism equity mission. These are the, our four district goals of professional development, the curriculum, the policies and procedures, and the school culture. And in that, in our committee, we have four um, subcommittees that are um, administrators assigned to each of these subcommittees to help make sure that um, whatever gets produced that from them gets brought forward. And that's starting to happen as I'm on one of the committees and we're starting to produce materials and bring them forward. Um, these are the district professional goals. You know, expand our knowledge of the history of racism in this country. I think we heard a little bit about this um, from um, the update last month. Um, reflect on our own identities and how they are affecting how we lead, teach, problem solve, and communicate. And identify how systematic racism has impacted our schools, communities, and personal lives. And use this knowledge to make effective change. So, again, just the, the general overview goals. And then our next. You know, um, our administrative professional development goal, um, we, we've all 
We believe that anti-racist school leadership is about becoming racially aware and developing skills to dismantle racism associated with associated oppressions in our school and community. Um, and these were the guiding questions for the administrative team. What do we need to be effective anti-racist leaders? How can we be the best coach? How can we best coach our staff, students, families in creating anti-racist schools? How do we effectively support anti-racism subcommittees in their work and our policies, curriculum, instruction, and professional development, those pillars I just talked about? And how do we communicate and expand our work with the larger community members, with our larger community members? And so this is kind of the, the bread and butter, right? That was kind of the introductory that kind of gives you the, um, you know, what have we been up to and what do we have planned ahead? So, you know, this summer we created the um, anti-racism you know, equity committee and um, we work with them to create the subcommittees. Um, and obviously, as, as I said, each administrator is assigned to a subcommittee. Um, on October 7th, I talked a little bit about this last time, but we maybe we met with Dr. Elizabeth Pryor, just with the administrative team. She did then come back and worked with our staff on November 3rd. Um, so we might hear about a little bit more about that later, but she's an amazing person. We were able to really pick her brain, not only about academically, use, academically using the N-word um, or it comes out in the classroom and how to work um, with that, but also how to support teachers. And then we kind of pushed her a little bit farther, like how do you help us as leaders? And she did the best she could in that area too, but she's wonderful. On October 26th, we did um, a half-day professional development, either the morning session or the afternoon session. All the administrators did this as well, which, which is the REI virtual groundwater. And this was just really a fact-based um, professional development that um, really looked at the racial inequalities across all systems, not just schools, but um, our prison systems, our work systems, um, and Kim, you can jump in and some of the other things that are not coming to my mind right now, but really looking at the social economic differences and not just education alone. Um, and that all of these things together are the groundwater problem and all these areas together need to be fixed. It's not education alone, um, which is in one case, like two is not only our job, but it's, this is where I think we're gonna get the most traction starting in getting change in our school. Um, you know, I thought it was really informative. However, it didn't give me the leadership professional development that some of us were hoping for in the sense of like, how do you then take this information and lead with it? Um, so that's where I said, we're gonna, we have a little hiccup um, in our planning that we're gonna have to look for another organization that's more about, you know, how do you take you as a leader? How do you be supportive? How do you set things up um, for the long term? Because this is not a one-year plan. This is not a two-year plan. This is something that we have to be continuing. And how do you set a mission that's not gonna burn out um, after one year, maybe two years. Next page. <clears throat> um, on November 3rd, the, the administrators, you know, attended the, the, the full day of um, racism and equity PD. Um, and um, in, we, right now we're reading the book, the, uh, Between the World and Me. And we have our first um, discussion of a portion of the book next week. And then the second discussion of that book you know, on December 16th. This is kind of our in-house um, um, reading and, and, and PD from that. We are also at the same time, um, it was not really due, the due date is not until January 6th, but I think most of the administrators have already gotten ahead and done it already. Um, but the podcast, uh, Nice White Parents, is, an, is a, if people like listen to podcasts, it's a great one where good intentions were not, um, don't necessarily bring about change in schools. It's not based all on intentions. What was it like for the New York public school systems? Um, um, how they were dealing with their race, um, in um, race, racism within their schools and how what happened when um, white parents tried to join a school and thought they were gonna fix all that by bringing um, you know, their white, nice, nice white parent intentions and it really didn't help the bigger picture. And so it's very interesting looking at a real life scenario here. Um, on January 22nd, we have more, um, it's another professional development half day. We have more consultants coming. Um, and I'm gonna let Kim talk about that when she talks about the November 3rd state, because it, it's a lot of a continuation of what we did on November 3rd, um, but the ministries will continue to be involved with that. Next, last page, or I think. Um, February and March, we have another book, um, the, um, you know, the Origins of Our Discontents. Um, and we're looking to get a group book facilitator for this particular one to help us lead us through and push us a little bit further than we got from the first book. Um, and then the April, May, is the TBD. This is again where I was hoping that the REI, maybe we'd have a second session there. We're thinking about changing and we're, we're looking right now for 
what's out there for educational leadership. And a lot of things are emerging because there's been a, this this calling by not just superintendents, but all educational leaders about what, what's out there. And so groups are being created to help support leadership. And so I'm hoping you'll be able to fill that in and report back to you there. And then May going into summer is, okay, reflection and planning for the next year. It also includes meeting with our leadership committee um, in the different um, committees of our anti-racism and equity um, committees and talk about what is year two going to look like and then develop the professional development for that next year as well as our own. And maybe even that summer, um, hopefully maybe continue something we pick up in April and um, April and May. So that's, that's I, I went through it quickly. Again, you have a copy of all of it, but that's kind of the overview people are looking for a um, that's our, the professional development in addition to um, what's happening with the teachers um, as well. So Kim, I was going to say, then Kim, can you talk about a little bit what the teachers just did the amazing day on November 3rd? Um, that could be the, the anti-racism equity update. Um, I, Bob, I know you raised your hand. Questions in that? No, I was just asking, can we get a copy of the books? Do we have extra copies of it, Kim? Uh, we don't have any, but we can get some. That's no no problem at all. So we can get some. That's a great idea. I would love to read both the books. I'm, I'm not much of a book reader, but in this case, I I would like to. That's great. That's great. great. We'll, we'll get those out to you. They come in pretty quickly. So. Okay. Yeah, and, and Bob, 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 you'll be okay. It's not it's not that bad. You'll be okay. You know, <laughs> it, it's well written. He's a, he's a great author. Can I, read it? can I read it when I'm sitting in my tree stand? You, yes, you technically you could, Bob. Technically you could. You can also um, there's some great um, podcasts, and um, just if you're not if you're not really if you want to kind of get a flavor for without, you know, there's there's great podcasts in uh, YouTube videos with interviews that can give you a good sense of um, you know what the book's about, and um, just the general discussions are, are really are really good as well. Right, Kim? Yes, perfect. So I'll just update you a little bit on um, what the elementary school has been doing for professional development, which is one of the pillars that the whole district committee is working on. But we started way back in May starting to make these pathways and we had a committee of educators um, with the help of our consultant, Amanda Mosea, to make two pathways, an identity pathway and the history of America pathway. And our last session is the 18th. We have had eight sessions with this. And as you could see, one of the very first goal is to build common language and foundational skills and experiences around systemic racism in our country and the history there. So we're just um, doing that. And as a culmination, we had a full day PD where we had um, Amanda speak to us and we worked on our pathways some more. And the, the staff is loving their pathway groups. Their reflections are so deep and powerful. And I've gotten a lot of emails saying, let's not have this end. You know, the trust was made and the communication is there and people are taking risks when they're talking about these very um, deep and challenging topics. When we round the court, so the PD on November 3rd was to set up to say, okay, now we're building this understanding. What do we do next? And we want to round the corner to how it impacts our classroom. So on that day, we had a bunch of pullout sessions that started talking about curriculum and communication and engaging and challenging aspects and how the relational aspects of going deeper with students is really important. So when we round the corner into January, that's when we're going to work with the collaborative. There's Sapphire DeJong and Romina Pacheco and Amanda Mosea will continue to work with us. And we're going to fine tune this and put some of this knowledge in the skills that we have to support curriculum and anti-racism culture in our schools. We are so lucky we've been asked to join in the collective promise from Empatico, which is an amazing thing that will help our classrooms in third through sixth grade partner with urban schools with children that look different and have different experiences all in the United States to, as an action plan to understand and develop perspective and then to work together to think and problem solve on some action-based project. So we're lucky to be involved with that and that survey 
is going out for teachers and that will start with January. But there's a lot going and this is a multi-year initiative and we've got really good things started this year and really trustworthy consultants that are they're helping us shape the way that we want to go. Good. Sounds great. Yeah, it sounds really good, Kim. I hear, I see Lisa, who is a teacher, nodding her head. So that's great. Okay. Um, reports. Um, I do not have a chair report or a collaborative report. I guess, I guess that's me then. Um, <laughs> yes. A lot of what I was going to report on was the phase three, but um, got a little bit. Um, and I can share it with you. I can like actually share the document with you so that you can see uh, I've got a breakdown of each grade and hybrid and full remote because um, it has changed a little bit since the last time. Uh, we're continuing to settle into the school year under the hybrid model with the option for full remote. The students are doing a great job of remembering to bring their masks and also remembering to keep them on. Um, there are solid routines in place for hand washing and hand sanitizing, and we continue to work on keeping safe distance. Families have been forthcoming about information regarding anything that could pose a risk, a child with symptoms, a family member with symptoms, travel, etc. Our nurse, Andrea Gray, who's brand new, and it was, you know, really baptism by fire this year, She's been such a great resource for families to call and ask, like, is this something I need to be concerned about? Or, you know, with a little cough, is that reason to keep my child home? Um, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate that honest and open communication coming from families, because I really do believe it is what has kept us safe this whole time. We have had, you know, lots of incidents where either a staff member has been tested or um, just out of an abundance of caution, and we've been very, happy to report zero COVID cases in our school community. So um, I'm, that makes me feel very hopeful. You know, over the summer, I wasn't sure how long we were going to be able to pull this off, but thanks to the way everyone's pulling together, here we still are. Um, I wanted to um, thank the staff. They've worked so hard to make this in-person learning a reality. Um, it's an incredibly heavy lift to make things work, and I want to publicly acknowledge that hard work. If you haven't seen what goes on behind the scenes, there's no way to truly understand the effort, flexibility, creativity, and stamina it takes for us to provide a positive educational experience for our students this year. Um, even being in education, if I had not been in classrooms and seen what this looks like, I don't think I would have fully appreciated how hard it is for, for the staff to be, to be doing this. We've always had a very dedicated staff here, but this year they're truly exceptional. Managing the competing needs of social, emotional, physical well-being alongside a solid academic program is a feat that surpasses anything educators have ever had to manage in the past. From the bottom of my heart, I'm grateful for every single Waitley Elementary School staff member. And another thank you to veterans. Another sacrifice that has been made due to COVID is our annual Veterans Day Assembly. It is always a wonderful event and it is sorely missed this year. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all of the veterans of our community as well as current service members. Although we couldn't show our gratitude in person, we remain, great, we remain grateful as ever for the sacrifices that have been made in the name of freedom and security. And that is it. I know the teachers are holding up well in, in most cases and how are the parents holding up? Well, You're smiling. <laughs> we have um, a few. I know we have a few of them on the screen here. I, you know, how about they give our your opinion? I, my kids are both living in California, close to thirty years old and stuff. So, um, I will say that we have settled into a routine, and the kids always look forward to their in person days the most. Um, but I think it's been great on both ends. Um, you know, it is a little stressful and we all have to work from home on our different devices, but um, the teachers have just been really great. Uh, I have a second grader and a sixth grader. My sixth grader is fully independent. Um, 
but my second grader needs help, say that the teacher has been wonderful in showing them how to do things on their own. And that's been really, really helpful for parents. I have to agree. Uh, my kids definitely look forward to the in-person days and we have gotten into a routine. Um, don't think I have the independence that Beth's, or I don't think my kids have the independence that Beth's has, but um, they're, they're, doing, they're doing way better than in the spring. And I, I think it's going well. Yeah, the reality is this was hard on everybody. There was like no one left out of this, you know, level of difficulty, whether it's the staff or families or Darius trying to, you know, juggle all these, all these balls at once. Uh, this, this situation is sort of universally difficult, certainly more so for some people than others, but I don't know of anyone who has sort of escaped the, the difficult nature of what's going on. And the fact that people are just, you know, doing it, we're doing it, it attests to the, the sense of community that we have here. People are just pitching in and doing what needs to be done. Thanks. Okay, Darius, do you have a superintendent's report or did you cover that in your other, okay. I did not, so it was covered in everything else. Are we going into executive session, Darius? Okay. I don't have a need for it, no. Okay. Okay, then. I'll make a motion to adjourn. Second, Beth? Second. Okay. Um, we're going to adjourn the meeting at 5.05, Bob? Yes. Beth? And Maureen, yes. All right, thanks, everybody.